Ready to do this, Cage? Let's hear it. I changed the screen on our YouTube so our faces are bigger. I hope that's okay with you. No backdrop. Just right in your face. All right, Luca Nation. Recording live from the National. Recording live from the National. We want to welcome you guys back to another episode of Lucas, Tigers, and Bronzo Mai. And before we get into the show, and I have a few really interesting kind of eclectic topics to discuss today. Cage, right before this, you said we're not even giving plays for National anymore? Well, you is, can. Is that right? Well, you is can. So, I mean, you're at National. You gotta, we got to start it off, right? You're at National. So let's, let's set the stage, right? And I think what might be helpful for today's episode, if, unless you tell me, no, that's stupid because you always have a cool way to take this stuff, is, you know, for today, for tomorrow, for the next day, you're there. Like, I want tomorrow to hear about what you did. You're there early, right? You're there Tuesday. A lot of people aren't there yet. I- I'd love to know tomorrow, you-, you know, maybe you can report back what it's like, or maybe you can start talking about now. What was check-in like? Is there an energy? Is it, is it you know, th- are people excited? You know, how- what's the setup? What kind of boots did you see? What kind of cool cars did you see? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And me, on my end, if, if it's all right, I'd like to to talk to Luke and Asian, people who haven't been there before, people who are not there yet, people who are in the boat that I'm in, and maybe or think about this for next year or whatever it is. Like what I'm, how I'm contemplating now, like what am I bringing? You know, how, how do I prepare for it? You know, like I got a whole big collection. Do I bring a whole bunch of raw? Do I bring some graded? Like that kind of stuff. Because I don't know. And I, I, I would love to kind of go through that with you, see what your thoughts are, what you brought, you know, and, uh, Maybe because I'm not going for two more days. Maybe you know, Luca Nation can chime in and say, "Don't bring anything," or bring. You know what I'd love to do? I'd love to bring some cards, like a box or two of cards, and not bring that much cash, and use those cards. They're ready for something I'm going to churn in my collection, and use whatever I get, sell, trade those cards to buy cards at the show. Maybe something like that. That'll be a cool thing. I feel that when you go to a show, you need. So, so, of course, you want really valuable cards, but I think you also need cards that catch people's attention. So, like, I, I'm curious. What, what When you asked yourself that question, you know, what cards should I bring? You have a basement full of cards. Yes, you know, pretty the, much. The infamous basement. Maybe one day we'll get a story post, a picture of what that actually looks like. Uh, a picture of arcade. Is there a couch down there? Is there, like, no. is there a main It's piece? unfinished. It's just boxes. It's just, just go- it's like 17 years of garbage down there. It's bad. That's, that's where you store all of your wasted dreams. Cards. Wasted dreams. No, not all the cards. That's like some cards are down there. All the cards are in a safe. Okay, and you and know? so what, what are you thinking of bringing? Like, are you thinking of bringing cards between thousand to ten thousand dollar range? Are you thinking fifty thousand and above? Are you bringing your Montana, your Rice? Are you bringing your the few inserts you've picked up? Where are you leading towards? So there are a lot of cards that are in vaults, various vaults that I don't have access to. So I'm not going to be bringing any of those. I have a lot of cards on hands here, um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I still have to I have to figure it out. I don't know if I'm bringing a bunch of raw stuff that I just haven't graded. And hope to trade some of that. I don't know if I'm bringing slabs, you know, low slab, low, you know, like hundred, a bunch of a hundred dollar slabs. Like, how do you pack it? Like, if I want to bring a couple hundred cards, what do I do? Put them in a suitcase and check yeah. the bag. Carry on. Just carry brought, on. Yeah, people brought in their slab case. Carry on slab case. Yeah, and then PSA pulls you over for all your Zions. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what exactly I'm gonna do. I have no idea. I mean. You know, I, I think I'll, tr- I'll ultimately end up with sort of like a, a combination, you know, some hundred dollar stuff, you know, in volume, maybe a couple thousand dollar things, you know, some sports stuff, some stuff I really don't want to actually move. You know, I'll probably bring a Luca Silver, maybe I'll bring the Trey Red uh, PSA 10s, you know, every time I, I bring that out, the color match, people are interested in that. I'm sure that would fetch me something decent in trade, um, you know, those kind of cards. Um, I I really honestly don't want to carry around a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of cards with me, you know, if I can avoid that, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's the national, right? You're supposed to be doing it. You're supposed to be bringing your stuff to the show and wheeling and dealing, right? So it's a little it's a little different for me. Also, I think, go ahead. I think if I take a page out of Rips' book, if you go – because Rips goes to shows. Rips knows how to uh, – Rips has been doing this for a while, which is funny to say because he's, a, what, 17 years old now? But I think what he did well, and I saw a few posts, he has a lot of colorful stuff, right? A lot of modern, Trey, Giannis, uh, a lot of modern stuff. He pairs that with some vintage that has a lot of value. And then he also had, the, you know, like he brought like 10 Tatis or 50 Tatis base rookies, right? He has stuff that's super liquid that he can trade out of or color out of. 
So I think he has all the uh, bases covered. He has base rookies of Tatis and PSA 10. He has some really nice colored trays in Giannis. And then he has a vintage. And I think that has a lot of his bases covered. Yeah. I think that's probably the way I will go. Some Pokemon, some modern stuff, a little bit of vintage I'm, stuff. I'm worried about Pokemon. No one's talking about Pokemon recently, Cage. Eh, there's a 25th anniversary set coming out. It's going to be a really cool set. People talk about Pokemon. It's just you're not in that space. We're you just know, not in that you, circle? If you meet Don Diego, who you had on the show, you brought her in. You were one of the first people to have her on the show. And now she's doing a whole bunch of great content out there. If you meet her, what do you think she's going to talk about? She's not going to talk to you about Luca. She's going to talk she to you about Pokemon. Pokemon. She, so, knows po she knows Pokemon. But there's yeah. so many sets, Caves. There's so much. It's, it's a whole learning curve in and of itself. Yes, it's true. And I have a bunch of that stuff too. Maybe I'll bring some. Maybe I'll bring some modern Pokemon, some you know, some vintage Pokemon. We'll see. I'll tell you, the last Bleaker trading event, I brought out some Pokemon cards and there were some Pokemon folks there and they were like, whoa, look at these. Like, can I take a picture of this card? Like a Top Sun Charizard that you know you don't see too many of. Um, and uh, you know, so people still know it. But yeah, I mean, look, Pokemon was kind of pumped up, right? F1. F1 kind of pumped. I mean, like, you know, they're a cycle. Is that, was soccer pumped? I, I read a great tweet today about soccer because um, soccer was soccer demand was so underrated that when there was so, – like, here, here's the tweet. So, the hobby slept on soccer cards for so long that manufacturers are overcorrecting by releasing too many products all at but once. That's exactly what I said about F1. It's exactly what, but that, but it's not overcorrecting. That's what happens. They meet the demand, then they then then they just they they put too much out there. It's exactly what happened with UFC, right? You were stuck with just stickers and World Cup, and then there was some seventeen releases, some eighteen releases, and then obviously it got huge, and then boom. Now I'm telling you, my guy is trying to pull an off Bundesliga finest. So it's not just like baseball. Okay, we got the major league, Chrome finest stadium. Now it's every league. You got a Champions League finest and a Champions League Chrome and a Champions League, uh, you know, and a, and a Bundesliga this. And a, I mean, there's so much stuff. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the prices of everything. I think so too, short term. But NBA went through that too, Cage. Like if you look at the 2013 set, there's a uh, base, prism, and green. Then to, by 2015, they added colors. But now you look at 2018, they have green, blue, red, pink, all this stuff. But what. But what happened was the draft classes of 2017, 18, and 19, they were able to create demand to match the supply. So right. it's not necessarily that soccer is going to overproduce or F1's going to overproduce or anything or UFC. You need stars. You need draft classes coming in that bring demand. Right. And Bundesliga finest. I mean, is Jude Bellingham and, and Moose Kaka, are they really going to like, you know, are they really going to drive the demand? Bundesliga doesn't market that well, to be honest, just as a league. G German soccer doesn't th – they're great for breeding amazing talent and, and developing great talent, but they don't market that well as, as in their overall but There's another release, though, for Bundesliga like every couple weeks. You'll see. Check out the Slab Stocks auction okay, for charity. Okay. It's like a, it's, a ton of, it's a ton of soccer. But, yeah, I mean, listen, the, the truth is uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. But there's a lot of people collecting. So Pokemon goes through a cycle. Listen, on F1, you know I crap on F1 every now and again. Check out J.J. Watt's most recent tweet. Right, J.J. Watt tweeted about F1 saying, hey, when I first started watching F1, all I knew was Lewis Hamilton. And now I know all this stuff. I know about these different guys. I know about the rivalries. I, don't, I mean, it's crazy. So obviously there are people who are into F1, not me personally. Um, you know, it's just not my bag. Um, I have too many. I have too many things. I can't pay attention to all these things. I just can't. Um, huh? But yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. And I'd love to hear what people say. But, but I think Rips, that, that suggestion, that's a good idea. I think, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, because you never know, you know, what might be hot, what you might sell, you know, where you might be able to go with it. Um, you know what I'd love in my, in my perfect, perfect, perfect world? I'd drop my Charizard 9 off at PSA and say, regrade this bad boy. And say, listen, I don't know what it is, 1000 bucks, whatever it is to turn it around. This is a 10. You all know it's a 10. Give me a damn 10. Well, maybe I sent it to BGS on day first day I'm there. BGS gives it a nine and a half quad, and then I take the nine and a half quad over to PSA. PSA makes it a ten. I don't know. But Nat, nice. Nobody send this to Nat before we <laughs> operation be nice. operation Valkyrie. Uh, Cage, I think you should make that move. We, we, 
you have no idea. I get DMs all the time. When's Cage finishing the Pokemon first edition set in a PSA 10? All the time. People want you to do it. And uh, God knows NFTs have been good to you this year, whether that's uh, Top Shot or Twitter just miraculously choosing you to send you an NFT. So that's me and Twitter are friends. We're you pals. and Twitter are friends. You, they watch me. They've watched enough of our YouTube videos to know that I jiggle. How could I not get a Twitter jiggle? So I heard, okay, two things, and then we're going to get into the show a little bit more. I have a question for you. I have a play. and Ooh, uh, Let's hear it. So for one thing that's really cool, and I think a lot of us will like this, uh, only all, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, they now have this Chrome extension where you can see the best price, uh, the best offer price, the actual offer price that things were sold at, wow. which is huge, huge, huge. And it always reminds me of this quote, Cage, you know, beware of the quietest one in the room. I don't know if you've heard that, like in, in business and corporate, you know, yeah. uh, there, there's always a lot of a lot of noise, a lot of talking. And to me, I got to give credit to the only alt and their team. Uh, we know Lior, but it's more than Lior at this point. It's their team and how well they've been able to do to build their business, listen to their community. And they haven't been the loudest. They haven't done marketing. They haven't done all this other stuff that other companies do. And, and they're constantly improving and innovating. So I'm really excited about the future of only all i heard another cool step well first off any comment on that anything you want to touch on there no i'm excited man because i know you're there already it's boots on the ground which is always a lot of fun and you know i'm, I'm curious if did you see anybody when you were checking in did you see any celebrity did you see jeff did anybody charge you ten dollars for picks while you're waiting to check into the hotel i didn't check into the hotel you did I, I, I just ro rolled right through I was in customs line for two and a half hours. So my buddy who has global entry, apparently that's the way to go. He, uh, <laughs> he, he, he just got through and he got to the hotel two hours before I did. We were on the same flight. Well, let me ask. A lot of can. PSA bags though. A lot of PSA bags. Uh, should here. I bring my P should I bring my PSA bag? This way I can be one of the people. Hard, 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 hard to say no to that. Hard to say no to that. I should bring go. my PSA bag. I think I'll bring a PSA bag. I think that's definitely the way to go. Let's see. So you brought a valet with you. So, but you don't have to answer that. So here's my question, right? I, I brought my I brought my consigliere. Did you have any trouble at all getting back into America with your <laughs> obvious issues there? That, that while you're hiding in Mexico. No, no, I mean, is wait, is waiting in a customs line for two and a half hours issue? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, like when you showed him your passport, did you get any like sideways looks? You know, did anybody like, oh, yeah, it's this guy. You, you're going to have to go into that other room. We're going to need you to, we're going to need you. No, it was none of that. It was just, okay, welcome back. America's happy to have you. The greatest podcast host of all time. There, there, that's it. That's you were welcomed in with open arms. I was just smiling, charismatic, and just pleasant. So, no, never had any issues. Right. When I drink, I get aggressive. So, that's why I don't drink. When I drink, I get aggressive. I start talking with my hands, and authority figures don't like that. I've, I've had a few run-ins. Maybe I'll tell you guys <laughs> that. But those were my, my different days. <laughs> Here's a cool stat, Cage. Yeah, so, I it. seven out of the eight new coaches in the NBA this year are African-American. And five of them are first-time coaches. First time coaches. And what that's showing is assistant coaches are now getting more and more and more and more opportunities in the NBA. So I was listening to where I got this information. I was listening to Waj. He was on the pull up pod with CJ McCullen. They were talking about the finals, you know, what they saw from Giannis, what, what the Suns are going to do in the offseason. Is CP3 going to stay or go? How the Suns have a ton of cap room. Uh, it was a great episode. Waj talks about Giannis's childhood a little bit. So I was listening to that, and and that that stuck out. Another thing he said is this is Jason Kidd's third head coaching opportunity at Dallas. What do you think of that? You know, if, if you – okay, you go once, you don't win. You go twice, you don't win. Is third time's a charm? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he's that good of a coach. So I think that's part of it, but – I mean, a lot of that depends on the situation you find yourself in. You know, I'm Nick Saban is Nick Saban that really that good of a college coach and was just that bad of an of an NFL coach, or just he happened to go and coach at Miami when Miami Cage. was terrible. I mean, and, and sure, Giannis was a little earlier in his development, but Jason Kidd coached Giannis. 
So is he responsible for Giannis's success, or could he not get it done with the best player in the world? I don't think he was the best player in the world. Who coached Oklahoma City in 2010? I don't know. But was it Scott, some, wasn't it Scott Brooks? But they had some pretty good players there too. I can't, you know, I mean, obviously they were just not who they are now. I don't really put that much stock into coach. I know you do, and I'm probably going to get killed for this, right? But, I mean, think about it, right? I think these players win – the coach can probably hold them back more than, than moving forward. I think coaches are more culture. That's why you see Pop. I think the game has kind of passed him by. Um, that's why Phil Jackson, I think the game has kind of passed him by too. Um, and that's why he had very little success not coaching, but just at, you know in the far office with the Knicks. Um, I think, though, that if talent, if there's enough talent there, you, win, you can win in spite of your coach, which I think is what Milwaukee actually just did. So I don't think Coach Bud, now a championship coach, is is a great coach, but now he's a championship coach, and no one's ever going to take that away from him, right? Is he responsible for them winning the title? No. What coaching, brilliant coaching decision did he make during that entire series where you're like, oh, there we go, there, that now he proves his he proves his worth? None. Pun intended. Um, was coaching more valuable in the '90s and the '80s when sports, when teams were a little bit more evenly matched? Was coaching never a big deal to you? To me, coaching is it creates culture, right? Leadership and coaching creates culture on the team. Yes, but I think you get more of that culture now from the veterans on the team, and I think the coaches that allow the veterans to lead that locker room and instill the culture are the better coaches. And you know what? So that's part of coaching, right? Because then it's, it's, you know, the coach understands the locker room. But, yeah, I do think that um, it meant more then. I saw a cool stat, right, today. And Michael Jordan, obviously everybody knows Michael Jordan. He was huge. He was the hugest player in the late 80s, early 90s. He was the guy, right? So um, I saw a stat today. Logan Paul, uh, not, um, Floyd Mayweather made $100 million in 24 minutes versus Logan Paul. Michael Jordan made $90 million playing for 15 seasons. Now, obviously, th- I give that for a reason. Jordan made a lot more money than that because of his, because of his, you know, his, his off-field exploits. But think of everybody else he played with, right? Think of the money they were making. There are guys he played with who are top 50 NBA players of all time, right? Top 75 NBA players of all time. And they made $30, $40 million for their whole career. There are guys who are scrubs making that now for the whole year. I just, Spencer Dinwiddie, not calling you a scrub, just said his demand is five years, $25 million a year. I saw that. That was crazy. You know, and, and he'll probably get it. You know what I mean? There are guys getting so much money now, right? And I'm not saying these guys, they make so much money to say, screw you, coach. But it, it does come up with a different culture in that locker room. And, you know, the coaches, you know, just the, the whole sport with the money and the whole success of these guys, it has evolved tremendously. Um, Social media is a very different thing now. So yeah, I mean, you know, the coach has to become kind of almost like a more of a, a parent that lets the folk, you know, who would be a good coach now? Bill Parcells. He always had his Bill Parcells guys and he let Pepper Martin, you know, talk to his team, you know, he'd bring those guys with him from team to team. And he understood that like his message could resonate through the players you know what I mean? He had, he had his inner circle. Yeah, so it would circle the message would come from the players, even though it was his message being pushed down by the players. Uh, where do you see of- Cage? Where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a head coach, an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator in that circle of trust? What role would you play? I'm the water boy, man. I'm gonna bring you some high quality H2O, and do it That's with pride. My tackling fuel, dude. Uh, it, it really does depend, right? It, I mean, it depends on the sport, right? Um. I, in, in, in my professional life, I really don't like delegating things. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a micromanager, right? I want to make sure that everything's done right and I have a hard time, you know, telling people like, okay, you do this and trust me that it gets done. I'll delegate it, but I'm going to be on you to make sure that it gets done and makes, and it's done to my standard. I think head coach, especially like football, you know, you have to, you have to hand the play calling off, right? You know, you have to let the offensive coordinator do his job, right? And, you know, some of them, you know, call the plays not, I probably wouldn't be very good at that. I'd want to pull all the plays myself and I'd want to run the defense myself, you know? So, you know, you got to know your own limitations. You got to know what holds you back. Right. So I don't know that I'd be a good head coach in the NFL, but in the NBA, sure. I think I'd be a good head coach. It's five players. I'm going to call the plays. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'll figure out when the challenges are baseball. I am built for a baseball manager. Give me my, give me, just let me play by gut 
let me play a little analytics involved. Give me a computer analysis. Give me some stuff to go by. I'll prep before the game. Little, a little gut, little, and just let me sit there and eat for nine innings. I'll spit some <laughs> seeds out. You know, I'll get some. I'll get some hot dogs from in the stands. Like you know, it's, it's slow. Yeah, man. That everything about that baseball managers. That's that. that just that, let's go. I'll take that. Let's go. I use my challenge at the wrong time all the time. I mean, that's what these managers do. You know. So we're going to bring you guys a show from National every single day. I think we're going to actually do probably a few guest episodes, Cage, if I had to guess. Sure. Uh, before I, I know we're not giving a play or. I'll anything. give a play. I'm messing You're with you. Pl- I'll okay. Give a play. I'll give a play. I had a curious little fun kind of uh, one, two, three, four. So rank these draft classes in order, Cage. Mm-hmm. 2003, 2018, 1996, 1984. Luca, LeBron, Kobe, Jordan, and a lot of other talent in those okay. classes. So if we're just if we're just doing the ones, I'm doing Jordan, LeBron, Kobe, Luca, right? right? So that's okay. number ones. But if you expand it out, right, I think I go 96 just from top to bottom. Just 96 has the most the most players top to bottom. Um, 84 has three really good ones with Jordan, Elijah, Juan, and Barkley. Mm-hmm. And some other talent in there. Sam Bowie, but, Sam Perkins. I mean, Otis Thorpe and a couple of other guys. But yeah, not, not, th- that's three. You can name three from, um, from LeBron's year, right? Between, you know, yeah, LeBron, D Wade. Uh, that's pretty much Jordan, Elijah, Juan, right? And then Barkley, give me Melo combined with Bosch, sort of. I mean, that's pretty close, man. That's pretty close, right? Uh, the 18 one might pass them all because Devontae Graham's going to win like six or seven MVPs. Um, but no, so seriously, it's too early to judge the 2018, but for right now, it's just Luca and Trey. You know, you're going to throw DeAndre Ayton in there and see what he does. Who knows what Bagley might turn into? I mean, it's really, really early still to judge those guys. I mean, the other years, they're almost all done. SGA. Yeah. John SGA. Jackson, although I did hear Colin that, Sexton. That, 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 that Oklahoma City rumor, they would trade their first round pick. And okay. SGA for the number one. Did you hear that rumor? Yeah, there's no way. There's no I mean, possible way. Why would they rumor. do that? There's no possible way. I don't know why they would do that. But the 96 just top to bottom. It's, I mean, it's a fantastic so, so here, right? so here, let, me, let me talk about that real quick. So, uh, Cade Cunningham. A lot of you guys might not have heard of him this year. You might have only heard of him from, like, media accounts. But he played at Oklahoma City. And frankly... As much, yeah, he put up like I think twenty points a game, but he wasn't that special of a talent. He wasn't that special of a talent. And first off, when I saw that rumor, I messaged a buddy. I was like, "There's no way this is real. Maybe they know something." Oklahoma City Thunder. Maybe they want a hometown guy, a guy who played at Oklahoma City. I don't see any possible way that that would ever happen to give up a proven talent like SGA, who's has a ton of upside for an unproven NBA draft pick. Who it's not a Zion. It's I mean, not maybe LeBron. SGA is coming into contract soon, right? So was he restricted this year? I mean, maybe SGA is is you know next year or whatever. Maybe maybe, maybe they just know they're not going to be able to pay him, so maybe they figure they get something for him now. And okay. Oklahoma City is basically just continues to trade this year for ten years from now, and that would also go in line with that, right? So it would, they'd have another guy for a couple of years. They'd have the number one guy coming out for a couple of years with you know they're I mean, they're clearly not in win now mode. So, you know, but I mean, SGA, he's young enough where if you win in win five years from now mode, he's somebody you'd want on the team. But five years from now, they're going to be paying him. You know what I mean? So maybe that's what they're thinking. I mean, that's really, if I were an Oklahoma City fan, I'd be kind of pissed off about that. But, you know. God, Let me talk you know. about something, Cage. Go. So going into the NBA playoffs, I said Giannis was a guy who had the most to gain and the least to lose. Okay, his mm-hmm. prices were already beat down. His cards were at its peak, six thousand, seven thousand bucks. They were two thousand, even fifteen hundred at one point. Uh, so I thought he stood the most to gain and the least to lose. I think someone else in this NBA offseason actually fits that category, and it's surprising that this guy is is in that that bucket. But it's LeBron. Now, now hear me out, guys. You might not think about it this way, but let, let's let's say downside. Okay. Let's say he doesn't win another championship. And let's also say that the Lakers don't make any offseason moves this year. Let's just assume that. He has Anthony Davis coming back, who's going to be healthy. 
Okay, speculation is going to be rampant going into the NBA season. This team is positioned to make a run, and it's still LeBron. So worst case scenario, nothing changes. They go into the next season. They're an average team. His cards aren't going to take a dive. His, car, his legacy is basically set. Correct. Do I believe in his base chrome at 20K long term? No, I don't. No, I don't. But I do believe in some of his other cards long term. Now, upside. Let's say they make some moves in this offseason. And this is actually a play on Palinka, not as much as it does on LeBron. Palinka is the GM of the Lakers. I expect them to make some aggressive, aggressive moves in the offseason. Okay? Whether that's Lowry and DeRozan coming there, whether that's Chris Paul coming there, maybe Bradley Beal. Maybe Bradley Beal. And here's the real kicker. Any one of those moves, however positive or negative long-term it is, Short term, it's going to increase his prices. So my buy now is actually, the, to me, the Topps Chrome is really expensive card, but but some of his other rookies are within a price range, and I think if any anything like that, Lowry, DeRozan, Beal, anything like that happens, his cards see a massive bump, and I would sell into that strength. To me, LeBron is the best opportunity between now and the when the regular season starts to kind of like. Uh, buy the hype, sell the news type of thing. And that would be my play. I think there's a real opportunity to take a look at LeBron cards while he's he's always talked about. He's always a big deal. But right now, everyone's talking about the Olympic team, Durant. They're talking about Lillard. They're, where's he going to go? Beal, where's he going to go? You know, Chris Paul. They're not talking a lot about LeBron. But all of these ancillary things could actually have a benefit on his cards. And I would c- take a look at them. Okay. I would say, you know, if you're listening to to Andrew, I would say, why not Anthony Davis? Because if you think, you know, they're going to make a move that's going to give people, you know, a thought that that LeBron's going to be going up, Davis's card's been beat to hell. We don't like weak links in America. But I mean, using your thing, though, buy now and sell in in the hype, couldn't Anthony Davis actually be a buy lower candidate and sell high hype if if what you're saying, like, that the Lakers make a move? I'm not saying it doesn't have to be an or. It could a be thousand. an end, right? You know, a thousand and, percent. And if and if his cards don't go up and you're hanging on to them, if they happen to win another championship, LeBron's legacy is pretty settled. I mean, that would pretty that would help definitely. But talk about Le- talk about Anthony Davis becomes a two time champ there, you know. So like we talk about two exits, you know, if the Lakers do something great in the off season and people move, up, you know, oh wow, they're gonna win again. Move your Davis cards in the preseason hype. If you can't sell them, they don't get a bump. Oh, if, if they're making their way in the playoffs, it looks like they win another championship. People might be buying those Davis cards again for a double championship. I'm not trying to, to take your play over. It's just when you start talking about the Lakers, you start talking about LeBron. I'm like, all right, well, Davis would make sense to me here. More risk because LeBron has much less downside. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just hit two Sadoransky Blues in a row. In the same pack? I should complain. You've been opening packs this whole episode? <laughs> Listen, I can't. Packs. I the, can't do it. I, I threw the, the phone over there. Listen, one of the best ones you got is going to be my play, right? And a lot of people are sleeping on this guy because he was injured and he ended the season injured, right? He ended it so, so people are like, oh, he's injured, he's injured. But recent news has him on the U.S. Select team, which means he's healthy enough to not just be ready for the season. He's playing now, right? And you can watch him play. And people don't realize this because people aren't looking at him. And I think while I like Patrick Williams, right? And while I like some of these other guys, um, you know, who were drafted, I like Wiseman. I think this guy wow. is going to give Edwards and Lamelo a run for that top three of this rookie class. And I think people are sleeping on him. He's a stat filler, a little small, a little small, um, but I think real good, real good player. I think you see like potentially fifty percent increase on his scoring this year. Um, I'm talking about Tyrese Halliburton, you know, ended with a pretty interesting little knee injury there, kind of overextended mm-hmm. his knee, but he's back. He's healthy. He averaged 13 points last year, 5.3 assists and three rebounds. That's a good stat line for a rookie, right? It's a rookie that flew under the radar, right? And if you told me this year, he averaged 20 a game, I would not be surprised, right? I would not be surprised if he has one of those like most improved player, Becomes the team leader kind of thing. I mean, De'Aaron Fox is there. Um, I don't know whether he stays healthy. You know, this Kings team is an interesting young team. They have a lot of good pieces in place. Let's see what they do in the draft. They obviously don't need backcourt help. 
Um, and this kid Halliburton, you know, he is a he is a good player. And I originally thought. Um, he might be too small. You know, he's undersized. And he's 6'5". I mean, you know, I'm hoping he puts a little size on. We've now seen with um, with Giannis that it can happen. I'm not comparing this guy to Giannis. But obviously, if people work and people, you know, put in the time to work, as he obviously did, he came back from his injury, is now it's Andrew's type of play, right? This guy's not going to win a gold medal, but he wants to play for his country, right? There are people who want to actually do this. They're playing for pride, right? This is the kind of guy I'll bank on, and here's what I'm going to do. This is a national strategy, and I, I you know, I was, I was hesitant to give it because now I'm going to compete against you guys. You look on eBay, you can get these cards, his Prism base card, because you know people are grading them, but not really. Prism base cards like five to seven bucks. Wow. Literally, this is like go back to 2018 when you were able to buy those, you know, Aitons for five dollars at shows. This is who I think is the third best rookie in this draft class. Now, you want to buy some color? Go right ahead. You want to buy? I wouldn't buy any PSA ones. Because there's not that many because no one's sending them in. So the prices are crazy and that pop eventually will go up. And it's a deflated population on those on those you know PSA. Uh, eventually, there'll be more graded ones. But I'd buy the raw. I'd look for some centered ones. I'd look for some nice ones at the show. And I'd stack a couple of these, five, six, seven, eight, ten dollars $10. Silvers are like $45, $55 on eBay. You probably, you know, 60 bucks. You probably get them, you know, two for 100 You know, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, find a couple of them in decent shape, 45 Maybe pay a little more. For one that's in good shape, that doesn't have scratches on it and, you know, is good centering. I think that could be a steal. I think ultimately, you know, when PSA opens up and you can grade those things, maybe a group sub or something like that, this kid's going to be a star in the league for a long time. I think he's going to have a great season. And I'm giving you a 5 6 $8 play. Why the heck not? And not only that, kid, okay, do you remember him on Top Shot? People yeah. love him. Yeah. The hobby loves him. Yeah. And you can just just for price wise, I you know the prism base people are not buying right now, and people have forgotten about him. Before he got hurt, people were all over him. You know he was a great play on Top Shot, and um, you know he's uh, he fits with the style of game that's being played now, right? He's not a big that's you know got one dimension. He's a stat filling guard, right? You know what I mean? Like he you know he shoots, he's gonna score. You know, he was a rookie last year, still finding his footing. I, I think if you tell me this guy's going to go out there and do, you know, 20 points, five rebounds, seven or eight assists, and be towards the, the top of the leaderboard in, in assists if they let him run point, maybe. I mean, you, you never know what they're going to do. He obviously did it as a rookie. You know, he filled up the stat sheets in multiple categories. Second year, let's see what kind of run he gets. Five, five seven buck prism. I love that play. Why not? You know, seriously, look at the, I get the last prism. I got eBay right up on it. Seven dollars. You just end it. So. I remember a day where Tyler Hero prisms were sixty bucks, and it wouldn't surprise me to see that this guy's cards would have that same type of run up because he has the potential. And yeah, because the market's been beat down on base prism, and he's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. So you could win in two ways. Exactly. And you always love that. Dude, it's a great, it's a great play. Seven thirty p.m. on the East Coast. Let's wrap this. We're gonna be bringing you content all week. Uh, Cage flies in Thursday. Tomorrow's day one of the show. Super exciting. A lot of people say the best deals are the first day and the last day. I don't know if that's true, uh, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of content. We'll meet a lot of people. Hopefully, we'll do a few guest episodes from here. Uh, stay tuned, guys. It's going to be a really, really fun week. Listen, we're not going to replace Coffee with Cage, but I anticipate a Cigars with Cage question and answer live. That would be cool. kind of cool. That's kind of we'll cool. Like, maybe we'll do it like, you know, late Friday night. We could do like an Instagram live. It doesn't have to be a full episode. We'll figure it out, guys. I mean, we got plenty of people coming, plenty of listeners going. We kind of want to hear from you what you want us to do, right? I mean, it's easy to just put a picture up and say, meet us at booth one, two, three. That's kind of not our style. You know what I mean? That's kind of our style is, you know, let's 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 go have let's let's let me get Starbucks and the first person to tackle Andrew gets a free PSA ten from Kate. I'm back to the tackling Andrew bounty, everybody. Now nah, listen, I'm excited. I'm excited, I'm excited you're there, man. I mean, go ahead and, and, and have some fun. Enjoy. Don't have too much legal recreational weed. You know, take it easy on that stuff, man. You know, we got, we got. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to Gibson Steakhouse to, for dinner tonight. Ooh, nice. That's a nice steakhouse. That's a nice steakhouse. Who's paying? Shy Wave Vlogs. Really? You're meeting Shy Wave Vlogs on day no, one? No, no, no. I posted, no I posted, way. He's not even I, there yet. He's in, he's in, he's, he's in a phone booth in, in, in Amarillo, dude, I Texas. Posted, I posted a story and he was like, yo, I'm at Gibson's now. I was like, oh, I'm going there tonight. He's like, so many dinosaurs here. Yeah, listen. The last the last live I saw from him was he left wherever he lives in New York, and he's in like South Carolina. He missed his flight. He's going to be there eight hours late. Yeah, check out his live. He's going to be there late, and you know, then you know, where am I? I'm in a phone booth in Amarillo, Texas. Anybody who knows that line, 
what movie that's from, I'll be very impressed. Where am I? Where am I? I got the Duke. I'm in a phone booth in Amarillo, Texas. Remember Moscow, the movie? Bellman. Remember the movie Phone Booth? Yes, I do remember that movie. That was Keith Sutherland on that voice. In case you didn't know. That was an interesting movie. Voice. Well, listen, let's let these guys go. It's already late. Enjoy. Enjoy steak. Enjoy whatever it is you're doing over there. And uh, leave some bargains for the rest of us who haven't gotten there yet. Thanks, Luke and A.